This is the beginning of part two in the lectures on the cranial nerves. Let's move on to the oculomotor nerve. Understanding the anatomy of the oculomotor nerve, the third cranial nerve, is critical to being able to identify pathology within the nerve. The oculomotor nerve emerges within the interpeduncular cistern and extends out through the supracellar cistern to dive into the cavernous sinus. From there, it extends through the superior orbital fissure, and it divides up in the orbit to innervate all of the extraocular muscles except the superior oblique and lateral rectus, which we'll get to on subsequent cranial nerves. It also innervates the levator palpebrae muscle, which is tightly adherent to the superior rectus muscle, uh, the two of them together referred to as the superior rectus complex. It innervates the, the levator palpebrae muscle, which becomes really important when we talk about sacrifice of the facial nerve and the importance of gold weights. Uh, the oculomotor nerve carries parasympathetic fibers that have come up through the skull base and joined the third cranial nerve, which is why we get a blown pupil when we interrupt those parasympathetic fibers and the sympathetic innervation has no counterpart. Here is a steady state free procession image of the oculomotor nerves emerging from the interpeduncular cistern. Cerebral peduncles, interpeduncular cistern filled with CSF, and there is the third cranial nerve. It's pretty big. The third cranial nerve emerging from the interpeduncular cistern. That's the normal anatomy of that nerve. We can use this to our advantage to identify perineural spread along that cranial nerve. This is a lymphoma that arose within the orbit, and there is perineural spread back along the third cranial nerve. I know that that is the third cranial nerve because the characteristic anatomy where it is coming straight out of the interpeduncular cistern to cross the supracellar cistern and dive into the cavernous sinus. This next anatomical concept is critical to an understanding of the third cranial nerve and its pathology and being able to identify it on imaging. Uh, this rather crude diagram Dem demonstrates the basilar artery. This is sort of a coronal plane. The basilar artery coming up, uh, giving off the anterior inferior cerebellar arteries, continuing up, uh, giving off the superior cerebellar arteries, and finally the posterior cerebral arteries. In cross-section, these blue discs represent the third cranial nerve. The third cranial nerve is going back and forth, anterior, posterior, while this, these arteries are being splayed out in the coronal plane. The third cranial nerve runs right between the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery, right in that notch there. Super important anatomic relationship that we can definitely see on imaging. Here is the imaging equivalent of that last picture. The basilar artery comes up, superior cerebellar artery, and then terminating in the posterior cerebral artery. And there, running right in between the posterior cerebral and superior cerebellar artery, there is the third cranial nerve. Same thing on the other side, superior cerebellar artery is a little out of the picture plane, but that uh, anatomy really well shown on this coronal image. Here's that same patient with lymphoma. Just to show that same anatomic relationship, basilar artery coming up, here is the posterior cerebral artery, and there is the enhancing, abnormally enhancing, third cranial nerve running right underneath it. So why do we get a blown pupil? Well, we get a blown pupil when there is uncle herniation, or sometimes when there's something else interfering with the third cranial nerve in its cisternal segment, uh, for example, an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery. The diagnosis of uncle herniation rests on the uncus, the medial aspect of the temporal lobe, not just moving slightly medially, but in fact flipping underneath the edge of the tentorium cerebelli, where it gets stuck underneath that edge and can necrose and can compromise surrounding vascular structures, like the posterior cerebral artery. So in order to make this diagnosis, you need to identify the edge of the tentorium. It's this dense object right here, and you need to find brain tissue that is supposed to be on in the middle cranial fossa on this side that is flipped over into the posterior fossa. A really important secondary sign is shift of the brainstem away from the affected side, enlarging the 
the the basal cisterns on the affected side from mass effect from the uncle herniation that is happening just above this cut the Third cranial nerve extends from the cavernous sinus through the superior orbital fissure. When you see enlargement of the superior orbital fissure, as demonstrated here, think about the third cranial nerve. In this case, the MRI shows us a heterogeneously enhancing mass with areas of non-enhancement and areas of brisk enhancement. This uh, enhancement characteristic is is typical of a schwannoma, and that's because this is a schwannoma, it just happens to be a schwannoma of the third cranial nerve extending through the superior orbital fissure. Here it is shown on the coronal plane, again running through and expanding the superior orbital fissure uh, there uh, corresponding to this area on the other side. The third cranial nerve can carry perineural spread as from this adenoid cystic carcinoma that arose within the lacrimal gland and it has spread back along the third cranial nerve through the superior orbital fissure and you can see also extending forward along other branches of the third cranial nerve here into the cavernous sinus. Number four the trochlear nerve. The trochlear nerve has a very long, tortuous course. It is the only cranial nerve that arises from the dorsal aspect of the brainstem. It wraps around from the back of the brainstem forward um, and runs through its own little dural sheath along the edge of the tentorium. From there, it goes into the cavernous sinus, and once it enters the orbit, it innervates the superior oblique muscle. It went all that way for that one task. That's all it does is innervate the superior oblique muscle. The trochlear nerve is minuscule. In fact, it is so small that it is usually imperceptible on imaging. Every once in a while you get lucky and you see it. Um, otherwise, you're only going to see it if it is affected by pathology. The most common pathology to affect the trochlear nerve is a viral neuritis. Usually that is not evident on imaging. You usually can't even see the enhancement associated with that nerve. So usually when you have an isolated trochlear nerve palsy, you're going to find that the radiology is negative and will make a presumptive diagnosis of a viral neuritis. Most of those patients do very well. Every once in a while you get lucky and you can actually see the trochlear nerve uh, traversing from the dorsal brainstem to tuck into the dural sheath uh, along the medial aspect of the temporal lobe and where from which it will uh, emerge again to enter the cavernous sinus. Uh, this is its characteristic uh, location. I will say that I more frequently see arterial and venous structures in this location than I see the trochlear nerve, so be careful uh, that you're not just looking at a vessel if you think you're seeing the trochlear nerve. Here's the superior oblique muscle running through the superior medial aspect of the orbit on either side. It's not a particularly large extraocular muscle, but it does a really clever thing. It doesn't go straight to the orbit. It comes forward and makes a turn around a little fibrous pulley and then comes over and inserts on the orbit so that it can rotate the orbit to the side. Here's that little pulley that the superior oblique muscle is running through. This is called the trochlea, from which the trochlear nerve gets its name. The trochlea will often calcify, sometimes asymmetrically even, but you have to be prepared to find it in that location to see it and not mistake that for a fracture or other pathology. That's normal calcification within the trochlea. I have very few examples of trochlear pathology. Here is a schwannoma running along the trochlear nerve uh, just as it's diving into its uh, fiber sheath along the medial aspect of the uh, tentorium. Uh, it has characteristic enhancement pattern of a schwannoma and uh, is in the expected location of the fourth cranial nerve. This ends part two on the lecture on imaging of the cranial nerves.